Oui, ma. Thank you for all you have done for me. I wish I could repay you, but God surely will. Oh, madam, it was my duty. No, no, you have done way more than duty. You have been everything to me. I have written a letter to give you your freedom and your dear Aunt Marie. Forgive me for any wrongs I have done. Yes. Will you call me a, a priest, please? Have you ever met someone who, at first, is not of any particular interest, but then, as you come to know that person, feel his goodness, see his generosity, his love, forgiveness, it changes your whole outlook on life, so much so that you find yourself wanting to be like him. That is who my friend Pierre Toussaint was for me. In my generation, the early 1800s, no one ever rose from their position, least of all a Negro slave. But Pierre Toussaint, the least of men in society, rose to be the first and showed us what it meant to be a true follower of Jesus. Oh, whether slave or free, he never stopped showing his love for all people. And that is why I must share his story with you. Pierre was born in 1766 in the French colony Santo Domingo, now known as Haiti. His mother and grandmother were household slaves on a plantation owned by the Barad family. Slaves made up 84% of the population. Fear of revolt caused civil authorities and owners to use severe repression and degradation. French Capuchin missionaries to Santo Domingo ministered to all social groups and pushed humane laws to protect slaves and work to educate them. The Barad family must have taken some of that message to heart because Pierre was educated in the French language, instructed in violin, and baptized in the Catholic Church. In fact, the Barad's young daughter, Aurora, served as Pierre's godmother. Pierre was a happy child, and the family reminisced in their letters as to his cheerfulness and kind heart. His younger sister, Rosalie, was an added source of joy in his life. Monsieur and Madame Barad moved back to France, but their son, Jean, stayed on to manage the plantation. His first wife died after only one year of marriage, and then he remarried Marie Elizabeth Bossard Roudin. In 1787, the fires of political rebellion began to burn. Jean Jacques decided to leave Haiti and relocate the family to New York for a while until the situation stabilized. Pierre, his sister Rosalie, and his Aunt Marie accompanied the family to their new home. Jean enrolled Pierre in a hairdressing apprenticeship and then left for Haiti to assess the situation. Unfortunately, he returned to find the recovery of his plantation a lost cause. Before he could get back to New York, he came down with pleurisy and died. The shock for Madame Barad was overwhelming when she discovered that not only had her husband died, but all the money they had invested was lost. Those were such hard times. I don't know what I would have done without Pierre. Creditors were coming to the house almost daily and I had no way of paying them. One day a friend came to collect on $40 my husband owed him and I had no way of paying him. 
So I gave Pierre some of my jewels to sell to pay the debt. Two days later, he returned with the $40 and my jewels. He had paid the debt himself with money he had earned hairdressing during his free time. That was his own money. I, I, I swore that I would repay him someday, but I, I did not know when. He said that it was all mine and he never wanted to see it again. Pierre was industrious in pursuing his career as a hairdresser. He worked from sunup to sundown, but always starting his day at 6 a.m. mass at St. Peter's on Barclay Street. His earnings in part belonged to Marie, but he voluntarily gave her some of his portion too. He just set aside a small savings and enough money to pay for a proper suit to tend to his high society customers. When Marie fell ill with throat cancer, Pierre would rush home from his customers to bring her things to soothe her throat, such as fruits and ice cream, and then he would read to her to distract her from the pain. Pierre was finally free at the age of 41. He continued to work, pray, and help those around him. Mr. Toussaint came to my home daily for 20 years to quaff my hair and my daughter's. Oh, he was the best. Always keeping up with the latest styles. I was one of many fashionable ladies who employed him. He was more than a vendor. He was a trusted friend. He listened, counseled us, always pointing us back to the Holy Scriptures. We began to refer to him as Saint Pierre, <laughs> although we're all Protestant and didn't believe in that sort of thing. There was no doubt that this man was different. The acts of charity that he did for black people and whites was astounding. If there really are saints, he surely was one. Everything he did, he did to the best of his ability. He was more than polite. He was full of kindness and sincerity. I never saw him without his prayer book in his pocket. Sometimes we would try to get him to tell us the gossip he had heard, but he would never do it. He would say, Toussaint is no newspaper, or I have no memory. Yet he always was cheerful and also made us laugh. He was a perfect gentleman. Pierre, why do you Catholics have statues and pictures of Mary all over your churches? Do you see the picture of your family member there? Mm -hmm. You like to look at this. Makes you think of her, love her more. Try to do the things that she likes you to do. It is the same. After four years of working, he saved enough to purchase the freedom of his sister, Rosalie, and that of the woman he loved, Mary Rose Juliet. They were married at St. Peter's Church in 1811. They loved one another deeply, and Juliet was a devoted wife and helpmate in all of Pierre's charity works. Sadly, his sister Rosalie died shortly after giving birth to a little girl, Euphemia. Juliet and Pierre raised her and loved her as their own. Uncle Pierre and Aunt Juliet taught me that charity was a Catholic duty, but they embraced it full-heartedly. A white French gentleman, my aunt and uncle had known it well, was reduced to poverty and sickness. Uncle Pierre and Aunt Juliet said nicely cooked dinners in such a way he could not suspect from whom they came. Uncle said if he had known, he might not have liked it and been proud. When Uncle Pierre would visit him, he would say, Oh, I am so well known. I have many friends that send me fine French meals. And then we'll go on to describe the courses. Uncle Pierre would come home and tell us and we would laugh so much. <laughs> when yellow fever came to New York and everyone was locked in their houses but not Pierre, Day by day, he went through the streets, entering the houses of the sick with no personal regard for his own safety. 
Once he discovered a sick man who was a stranger and completely alone. He took him back to his house and he nursed him, took care of him, watched over him, and restored him back to health. That stranger was a white man. I grew up in the home of Monsieur and Madame Toussaint. They took me and my brother in, and after our mother died, he bought us our freedom, educated us, clothed us, helped us find jobs, and even taught us to play the fiddle. He was the kindest man I've ever known. Many people received hospitality at home, both black and white. Monsieur and Madame Toussaint believed and lived that we were all brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter our color. Even those who were ungrateful to him, he never rebuked. He was a very forgiving man. From youth to old age, people described Pierre as having a happiness of spirit and vitality. He was not a somber, grave man, but full of spirit and animation. He had the happy power of dispelling gloom and anxiety in others. He was also very intelligent and given to reflection and contemplation. His whole life was one of thought and observation. Monsieur and Madame Toussaint were very generous with everything they had. <laughs> they helped our newly formed order of black sisters, the Oblates of Divine Providence, as well as Sister Elizabeth Ann Seaton's orphanage with the Sisters of Charity. He and his little niece Euphemia used to visit the orphanage regularly, bringing baked goods and treats. <laughs> he paid for so many black people's freedom. He was like Moses. He even provided a place in his home for young boys to come and apprentice in a trade, improve their education, and he would counsel them. His encouragement for others was one of his greatest gifts, always pointing to the true source of our strength, our Lord Jesus. His house was the happiest place. Pierre's love for Juliet, Euphemia, for us and for others, made it like heaven on earth. When Euphemia died at the age of 14, all of our hearts were broken. They all cried so many tears, yet Pierre kept reminding us, God's will, God's will always, and I trust in my Savior. After her death, Pierre kept working to raise money for the orphanage and opened the first school in New York City for black children. That is how he channeled his grief. The Great Fire of 1836 left him almost penniless, yet he kept working, gained it all back just to turn around and use it for others. A friend once said to him, Toussaint, you have enough for yourself. Why do you keep working? He simply said, if I stop working, I will not have enough for others. Pierre and Juliet gave generously to the new St. Patrick's Cathedral. On the day of its dedication, an usher refused to seat them due to their color. Pierre said nothing and was resigned to sit in the balcony. Immediately, another usher who knew him rushed forward to seat them in the place of honor. An immediate letter of apology came from the church board of trustees. After 40 happy years of marriage, Juliet died. Pierre loved her so deeply and he was never the same. But he kept going to Mass, working and helping anyone in need. He was loved and respected by so many people. Pierre worked 16 hours a day, even into his later years. Sometimes I would see him walking, and I would tell him to take the public carriage, but he would remind me that black people weren't allowed. It didn't matter that he was the richest and most generous man in all of New York. He would continue on, forgiving, praying, and caring for those in need. It didn't matter their skin color. I've known Christians who were not gentlemen, and gentlemen who were not Christian, but I've known one man who is both, and that man is black. Two years after Juliet's passing, Pierre went home to be with his Lord at the age of 86. St. Peter's on Barclay Street gave him a funeral fit for a king. Though none of his relatives survived to mourn him, the church was full of rich and poor, black and white. I am 